Hello and welcome to this video on earthing arrangements by Adrian Davey from Pure Electrical Training. If you are not sure what PME, TNCS, TNS or TT is, then hopefully this video will help you to identify each one and understand some of the basic differences. The definition from page 28 of BS7671 describes the earthing conductor, which is the cable that either comes from the DNO's TNS or TNCS supply or from an earth rod into the MET or the consumer unit sometimes wrongly referred to as the main earth, which is often one of the wrong answers in an exam. Figure 2.1 of BS7671, which is in the definitions, gives this illustration of the earthing and protective conductor terms. So when you are sitting your regs exam, you can refer back to this. PME stands for protected multiple earth, and you will be able to identify this earthing arrangement by looking at the connection for the earthing conductor as it goes into the main cutout highlighted in the red box. The cable supplying this installation would be a concentric cable as illustrated in this picture with the aluminium line conductors surrounded by copper cores that supply both the combined neutral and earth. If you were to take the neutral cover off of the main cutout, then you would see the main earthing conductor connecting to the same connection block as the neutral, as the cores around the outside of the line conductor can just be split between the two. This is where the C comes from in TNCS, as the neutral and earth are combined within the same cores in the supply cable, before then separating at the head with the neutral conductor and the earthing conductor exiting separately. At no point do they come into contact with each other again, unless in a fault condition. When we look at that as a circuit, then you can see the earthing and neutral conductors combined along the supply before separating at the main cutout. The DNOs also put additional source electrodes into the ground to reduce the external impedance, the ZE, and to supposedly ensure a good earth fault path back to the supply. But as we have seen from the E5 group, this has not been maintained by the DNOs and now the infrastructure is slowly breaking down. So we have something called diverted neutral currents happening, which we will discuss in another video. The on-site guide, page 13, gives a maximum external impedance, ZE, of 0.35 ohms, and anything higher should be reported to the DNO. Now, be careful if you are considering using this type of cable, as there are two types. Concentric, where the neutral and earth are combined, which should only be used as a DNO supply, as stipulated in regulation 411.4.3, and split concentric, which some people have started using for submains and distribution circuits, in domestic settings. One of the problems using split concentric is then how an installer terminates the cable and you start to see people demonstrating a severe lack of knowledge as demonstrated here on social media, no regard for basic protection or IP4X ratings of any top horizontal surface. Also bear in mind that this type of cable is not an armored cable and has to be treated in the same way as something like twin and earth. These are the two illustrations shown side by side. And later on, I will put all three of the main earthing arrangements on one screen so that you can screenshot it for future reference during your training. On a TNS earthing arrangement, the earthing conductor does not enter the head and instead is connected to the outside of the supply cable via an earth clamp, which will be of a heavier construction than a typical bonding clamp due to the fault current expected. You cannot use a BS951 bonding clamp to replace one of these and instead should contact the network operator. For your information, BS 951 2009 states in note one of the scope, second sentence down, such clamps are not intended for connection to the armor or sheath of a cable. You also have to consider the possibility that the paper insulated lead sheath supply cable may not be suitable for providing a connection to a means of earthing via the network distribution cable or that it is adequate for carrying the perspective fault current. Only the DNO can answer that question. The cable for a TNS supply was paper insulated lead covered cable or PILC and was made up of the following components. Bitumized jute, which is a long, soft, shiny bast fiber that can be spun into coarse, strong threads. Steel table wire, another layer of jute, lead shield, bitumized paper surrounding a paper tape impregnated with oil, wax and resin winding around the conductors. There were many issues with this type of cable, one of them being that the oils would dry out and the bitumen would crack if the cable was moved or interfered with. Installations supplied by paper insulated lead sheathed incoming service cables can also have a wiped soldered joint, 
onto the lead sheath with a braided earth tail attached into an MET earthing block. If this or the original earthing clamp were missing, then the force that you would need to use to ensure that a BS951 clamp was tight enough to the cable may also cause damage to the internal construction of that cable, which would go against regulation 512.1.5. With this type of cable, the means of earthing should be separate and continuous all the way back to the transformer. The on-site guide on page 13 gives a maximum external impedance, ZE, of 0.8 ohms, and again, anything higher should be reported to the DNO. If I show these illustrations side by side, you can see that the earthing conductor is terminated into the DNO's earth clamp. It could also be connected into an MET between the clamp and external to the consumer unit. Due to the DNO networks breaking down and the new danger of diverted neutral currents, the IET have brought out a new regulation. Regulation 411.4.2 recommends that an additional connection to Earth by means of an Earth electrode is made to the MET, which is essentially backup protection of the DNO source and additional Earth electrodes. Same for both TNCS and TNS supplies, which may then mean that the DNOs can let their network deteriorate further without worrying about the consequences. It will be interesting to see where this leads and whether we all eventually end up on TT systems. Finally, we have the TT system, where the earthing conductor goes straight to an earth rod or conduit disc in the ground on the prosumer side. And regulation 643.7.2 emphasizes the need to test the earth electrode before the system is energized for obvious reasons. If we show that as a circuit diagram, you will see that the prosumer's installation earth does not go back to the source electrode, and instead the prosumer has their own installation earth electrode. The on-site guide gives a value of 21 ohms for the DNO's earth electrode at the supply transformer, and goes on to say that a value higher than 200 ohms at the consumer's side should be investigated. If the resistance value is higher, then an RCD will need to be fitted that will limit the amount of current that can flow in a fault condition. And when an RCD is used for this, we are using it for fault protection. Regulation 411.5.3 basically shows that using Ohm's law, we can limit the touch voltage to 50 volts and says that the requirements are met if the RCD meets the requirements of table 41.5. Table 41.5 shows that by selecting the correct size of residual operating current on the RCD, we can limit the touch voltage to 50 volts according to the resistance of the maximum earth fault loop impedance, the ZS. Here are the two illustrations side by side so that you can picture them together visually. Finally, here are all the earthing illustrations side by side on one page. And as I've said, it might be worth screenshotting the page so that you can refer back to this during your training. Here is another visual aid available online from one of the DNOs to aid you in determining who owns what equipment and who is responsible for that equipment. When it comes to sizing the earthing conductor, you need to follow the guidance in BS7671 part five. Regulation 542.3.1 states that every conductor shall comply with section 543, and where PME conditions apply, you need to meet the requirements of regulation 544.1.1 to size the main protective bonding conductors, which we will discuss in the next video. It also suggests reading BS7430, for further information. Regulation 543.1 states that you either have to calculate the size in accordance with regulation 543.1.3 or select it in accordance with regulation 543.1.4. This essentially means that you either have to calculate it using the adiabatic equation and is applicable for disconnection times not exceeding five seconds. Or you can select it using table 54.7, which is shown here. Either way, the earthing conductor has to comply and you really need to read the whole section to fully understand the requirements. Most people just use this table and you would find that using a 25 millimeter line conductor would require a 16 millimeter earthing conductor. Just bear in mind that if you cannot see the earthing conductor throughout its length, then you will need to prove continuity, which I will talk you through in my next video, where we discuss how to test the bonding conductors using test method two, and what potential faults you might come across when fault finding, how to identify them and how to rectify them. As always, this video can count towards your off the job training or CPD. And please don't forget to like, share and subscribe so that everyone can benefit from the information contained within them. Thank you for watching and take care.